We can do it. Yes, we can. We can change things throughout the land. But we all must lend a hand. We can do it. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, your neighbor over there. A bit bewildered, but he cares. Tonight, we are at Evan Longin's home interviewing Ariella Berry Ben Ishai. Um, from Israel, and the people who are interviewing her are going to be from the Salem Center. Ariella has a doctorate of human development and political psychology. She teaches at Sapir College in Israel. She teaches intergroup relations, leadership for social change, coping with diversity in the workplace, and group facilitation in a multicultural society to which she belongs especially. She is a founding member of a cooperative community called Wahat Al Salam Neve Shalom, uh, which is a Jewish Palestinian cooperative. In the US, she's now teaching a course at Salem State that is about building partnerships in situations of protracted conflict. I'm Evan Longin. I'm from the Salem Center. I'm going to be on the reflecting team tonight. And the reflecting team uh, consists of my associates, Marjorie Roberts. Uh, a past associate of ours, William Blaine Wallace, who's now uh, the chaplain at uh, Bates College. And Stephen Gaddis, my colleague, is going to be doing the interviewing tonight. The questions are a very integral part of the collaborative interview. So both the questions and the answers we hope will be attended to tonight. Uh, we see this as a uh, process of learning and cooperative learning and collaboration. So Stephen is going to lead the interview. The three of us are then going to reflect on ideas that emerge and we're going to turn it back. I just wonder if um, it's okay at this point to sort of pause and, and uh, listen to a little bit of the team who's been listening and um, you know part of uh, one of the traditions we have and how we work is to um, offer reflections um, from places people have been taken to and listening to your conversation, um, mostly so that you're free to listen um, and be moved by anything that moves you and helps us return to you to see if any of that was useful for you in terms of helping you get closer to what's meaningful to you, what's precious to you. Um, so how would that be? That's good. That's okay. Thank you. So what stood out for us as we listen to Many times, many times, I heard Ariella use the term common goal. And I think it appears that a large part of her, her work has been staying and creating partnership. And I don't know, is that a kind of activism or what do we call that? Common goal, would you say just a bit more? Well, she used the word, I think, part of the beginning of her friendship with. Uh, Evan and Debbie was that they have been, they've remained in her life. They haven't come and left. And then she talked about going uh, for weekends to Nave Shalom. She was kind of drawn into this come, come, come. And she stayed. Um, so it seems that, that there's that sort of continuity, that presence, that's, that being, which is very important to her. And in much of her work, staying and creating partnership appears to define. Well, that's interesting because I didn't hear it quite that way, but I heard this paradox of her life, which is that all through her life, all through her travels, all through her comings and goings, uh, certain things were continuous. Her care. Her, her, her care for people, her concern about uh, people cooperating and living together uh, was continuous. Wherever it was, Mexico, uh, at Hebrew University, at Neve Shalom, there was this continuity throughout her coming and going around people being collaborative. You know, I was touched by the long, long-standing uh, continuity. Uh, the word, something in the back of my head, uh, 
at nine years old. Um, it was very moving to me. Um, I, I grew up in the Deep South and was witness to the uh, Civil Rights Movement. My father had a store on Main Street, so we watched it. Uh, but I watched at nine years old, and something didn't form in the back of my head until many years later. And I was uh, felt deep gratitude for having that, that yearning and sense of wanting something to change and wanting to do something at, at that young time in their life. Yeah. And it appears that uh, she's open, that Ariel is open to other things. She doesn't know quite what that will be yet. People have said to her, are you still there? <laughs> and, and that's an interesting comment, yes. So evolutionary open to so many new things. I, I have to tell you that I was uh, very humbled and moved that I was part of her story, <laughs> that I shared a place in her story with Che Guevara. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, powerful and that somehow, in a very personal way, um, despite how involved and evolved she is as a person, I, I still could bring something new to her life. Uh, and to me, that, that was so um, moving. Um, and, and you know, it's interesting. Um, I ended up in the Bay Shalom by accident. It's not that I had a particular interest in Jewish Islamic relationships between Israelis and Palestinians. I ended up there just because I'm concerned about human beings, uh, about people being in conflict with one another. And here I am in the Ve Shalom with Ariella. And um, there was something about her story that said the same thing. It isn't about uh, Israelis and Palestinians, it's about people. It's about people learning somehow to figure out a mechanism for uh, being together, existing together in an ever-shrinking world. I felt like I wanted to bring Ariella back to uh, debates uh, with me. Uh, it was, you know, brought up sort of the bizarreness of my morning because I was in my study uh, talking uh, with the student rabbi who's going to come and with the two presidents of Hillel about our uh, Rosh Hashanah uh, celebration on September the 9th, the Jewish New Year. And my colleague was in the next office talking to the presidents of Mushahada, this student Muslim uh, organization planning uh, Eid at the end of Ramadan, which is one or two days later and these two parallel processes going on and I know that uh, many of the uh, Arab Muslim students will come to Rosh Hashanah and uh, in fact Hillel cooked supper for uh, Mushahada at the Eid celebration but this phrase she used, conversations that go places, we, we don't have the conversations that go places, there's the stuckness that remains as much as we honor and uh, attend to one another, there are just things we can't find a way to talk about. And I, I felt like I wanted to bring it back to that. Uh, for the 9th, 10th, and 11th of September. <laughs> Maybe you will. And do you think, you know, she had used the word partnership. A partnership is one in which there is trust. I think, did she say? I, the distinction between friendship and partnership. partnership. Yeah. I was, was very curious. Yes. I, like I, wanted, to, I wanted to hear more about that. I would that. like to hear more about that. Yeah. About, but, but there was something that she said very powerful about that, that in friendship is a lack of making judgments about a, your friend. It was an acceptance. Um, and I, again, I think that's the 
theme of what all of us and all of our work are trying to achieve. How do we work with people? How do we partnership with them without judging them, without labeling them? Uh, that's so beautiful in her way of life. So should we end and see if any of this has any relevance to her? Squeeze together. <laughs> so it's uh, your chance to speak with me so they can be free to listen um, as well and, uh, about anything that you would like to respond to um, that you heard, or anything that um, you heard that took you to some place that's important to you. It took me back to um, to the early days in Wachta Salam when, when we didn't have kids really and we'd have long, long conversations um, into the night all the way to the morning sometimes. Maybe the kind of conversations that uh, Tom? Uh, yeah. Bill. Bill, Bill. Yeah. Uh, was hoping for because, because, um, because we didn't have anything to lose really. Mm and you could go anywhere in the conversation I and mean, then people there go more and and I, I have close friends in Wachti Salam who, who I can have bitter arguments with about serious issues and I can oppose them at meetings but there's that bond mm. from the years that we spent together uh, picking at each other and asking each other the questions that our kids are asking each other you know Civil war for us is a very real situation that can happen, and an invasion, you know, of all of the, the, the Arab countries is a is a possibility. And we often think, you know, it behooves us to manage ourselves differently if we think, you know, an ongoing, if we think not for five years or ten years, but to be in the area for a hundred, two hundred, or three hundred years, even though we don't have a right to be here, or we yes have a right, it doesn't matter. We're there now. And building partnership, every day you can build a partnership. And uh, I remember conversations I had with close friends uh, at a bonfire one night. And, you know, he asked me, you know, if, uh, what happens if, if the Israeli army comes in here and takes over and, you know, will you hide me in, in your house, for example? And my family is the Holocaust survivors. And so that's an important question to be asking because there were many people who hid you know, our family and, 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 and risked their lives. And so these are the kind of questions that we've asked each other. And, and there are uh, people uh, in our community and now, not just to, that, that I know that were the situation to come to such a point. You think of Lebanon, you think of Beirut, the way it looked for years and years. That's a possibility. I don't want to imagine that it, it will happen, but it could happen. How far would we stick our necks out for each other? How, how much we would risk our lives? And uh, from the day-to-day -day comfort of sort of bourgeois life in the Michelin, mm -hmm. everybody can be quite bourgeois, uh, it's important to remember. Mm -hmm. So on account of listening to them, it has you remembering some of these very important experiences you have. From the past and wondering, you know, now that we have kids and we have family, we have work, we're going, we're not having these conversations necessarily, but I imagine our kids are having these conversations and testing, but it was a painful thing to me a few, two or three weeks ago before we came. Um, my daughter said, uh, you know, she's, she's 17 and she's beginning to get notices to go to the army. And for uh, Jewish, Jewish Israelis, it's a clear thing, but that's how, that's how you serve your country, you go to the army. And, uh, oh, and I, I was also in the army, I wasn't in a combat unit, but I, I was in a, in, a, in a unit. And with years I have been very much more aware of the importance of conscientious objection and of refusing to go, because it's the longer defense army at this point. It's an offense army. And I know that my teenager, I, you know, if I tell her not to go, then she'll go, or, if, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I also feel a responsibility not to just let her make her own decision, but to be, to disturb her, the automaticness of her, of her decision. And many of the Jewish kids in Shalom have gone to civil service and have not gone to the army. And I think there's enough people going to the army, and 
it would be important for them to do that. And not only because of their friendship and Palestinians and the solidarity, but for their own conscience. If you live, build a life with Palestinians, and, so, and one of the questions that he asked me, this friend of mine who asked me, he said, you know, how it's possible for, for me to be in favor of peace and to go to the army? That's, an, that's a paradox. That's an oxymoron. It doesn't work. And in the Israeli mind, the Jewish Israeli mind, it works. There's no paradox in it. But with time, this has been more and more uncomfortable. And so my daughter's getting these notices, you know, and uh, she's, I say, you know, so what are you going to do about the army? And what does it mean that we're growing up together and that our lives are intertwined forever? She said, still, it doesn't mean that I don't have to serve my country. They, when they have their country, they will serve theirs. So I said, yeah, but what, what do you want to do in the army? And so by bothering the, uh, the, the, the ease at which that she's, I imagine she's not at ease because she has all her friends are Arab, and I'm sure they have difficult conversations until the morning also. But I thought I cannot let this pass without, um, you know, Paulo Freire has a great expression to problematize, mm -hmm. and I could not not problematize it for her. And at the same time, it's very e careful balance between creating rebelliousness mm -hmm. and then. And so I said, you know, I wonder if there's any way that you can be life-giving in such a situation, is it possible? And she said, you know, I volunteer in the Magen David Adam, in the, like the Red Cross, and Saturday morning she goes and she's a paramedic and she wants to become a paramedic. She said, I could be a paramedic in the army. I said, yeah, but if you go to the army, you're part of this statement. And the question is, how will you live it with yourself later? How will you do? And so she said, you know, I didn't choose to be born in this community. You parents decided for us. And I have to find my way. And she's, it's true that she has to find her way. But it would be very hard for me to know that, um, that, that she would reject some of this complexity or that she would make her life easier for herself. And um, she said, you don't understand what it's like daily, daily, daily. I said, I understand from my own perspective. I don't know what it's like for you. She said, yeah, but you made your decision already. And I still have to make my own. So I feel a responsibility not to let her just, you know, I feel I need to, we have someone in the community who was killed a, a, in an in a, in a accident that happened between two helicopters that were going over to Lebanon. And until that moment when they were killed, nobody knew, I didn't know, that he was in a combat unit. And in the same <coughs> class, there was another boy who was a pacifist. They have the same name. Tom and Tom. Mm -hmm. And Tom in Hebrew means innocence. Mm -hmm. And to me, these boys, when, as soon as they grow up, they're not so innocent anymore, and they're making decisions. But when he was killed in this accident, I mean, it began, our community began to be in turmoil. Because things that we had never talked about had to be talked about. And you can't talk about it when someone just died. You know, it'd be a community that uh, wants to encourage pacifism. Who is the success of our education? The one who defended his country and who fell, or the one who was a pacifist? And we had never really talked about this, and parents didn't feel that they wanted to force their kids to go in any direction. But I think there needed to be a statement, and it was not an easy conversation. And, and still today, they wanted to have a, like a memorial place for him and to write, you know, a child of peace that went in war. And it was not so clear that someone who even grew up in Ebesh but who went in to combat, if, if this was a child of peace, how does it work? And so Karen and I, my daughter and I were talking about this, and, the, and she was saying, look, I, I can't refuse and go to jail like you, but we have a neighbor who went to jail for a few months, and anyhow, everyone will forget it. It will have no meaning. And in the end, I have to live with my own decision of myself. So she's 17, next year she'll have to decide she has pressures from everywhere, and she needs to make her own decision. But um, I was talking before to the, the filmer and the, as a conscientious objector who had been in Vietnam, and I think what will happen years from now, you know, how will we look back on ourselves and our decisions and what we've done and, um, and what we didn't do in order to prevent the situation from getting um, more difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the last few years, I'm not so sure I'm doing enough.
Mm -hmm. Took me back to your description of your mother's wisdom and how it was available to you. But can't be uh, part of the problem or not part of the solution. I was thinking about the conversations you're having with your daughter and what kind of wisdoms may be uh, left for her. The question was raised by the respondents about the uh, difference between partnership and friendship. So I'm not sure I got that yet. I'm not sure I got that yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can I say what I heard from you? <laughs> what I heard was that the one distinction, you can tell me if it's wrong, is the distinction between whether there's a commitment to stay in relationship or and friendships, there's an automatic kind of or a built-in commitment to stay in relationship, and a partnership is where there's an overt kind of agreement to stay in relationship, even when conflict occurs. But maybe that's not quite. Deep. But I don't see. Um, I think I heard something. Different. Yeah, good. Now let me now. I'm really getting body again. Yeah. But I thought I heard you say that friendship was kind of friendship where you could relax, and that that partnership you were working on goals together something like that, that you were doing some work together and you had to come together and collaborate, that with friendship you were kind of more relaxed. You can be more relaxed, but you also don't have to commit to anything. There's certain things you can decide not to talk about, and you can go to the beach together, and the kids can play, and you can be friends, and you can share meals, and you, it's good to be friends in order to be partners. I mean, the partners that I have, we're friends also, but sometimes you're in a partnership and you don't like each other. Mm -hmm. And it's not someone that you want to go to the beach with right now. Mm -hmm. Because you're doing work mm -hmm. and it's very hard and and you were friends at one point. And I had friends who were, we were friends at one point and we will be friends again. But the partnership is something that goes beyond friendship. It's mm -hmm. good when the friendship is there because mm -hmm. the friends that I have helped me to transcend in moments that I could despair or that I could think there's no point, or that I could walk away from it. As friends, we, we, we couldn't walk away from it anymore. But sometimes you go through periods of time when you don't like each other so much, and you don't want to spend free time together, but you know that you can't walk away from holding both people's dear to your heart. Sometimes the temptation is to go only to your own people and to forget about the other, you know, how you had it, or you say, forget it, there's no chance or something. And you know that if you've made that commitment, maybe it's like marriage compared to romance, you know, mm -hmm. having a one night stand or a friendship where you're just going out with, it's you, 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 you decide to make it work and then you work to make it work and you like each other and you love each other and you're, you're in each other's lives, but sometimes you don't feel like being there. You want to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it reminds you that you have made the commitment that you can go back on. That's what I think we need to be building on. No, that really clarifies. Yeah. Friends sometimes know that there are some issues they just shouldn't go to. Right. So leave it out there <laughs> and uh, have another glass of wine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I also just, I don't want to monopolize, but are you, concern me, are you in um, any danger personally? Are you in any danger of walking down the street? <laughs> well, you know, the proverbial truck and bus. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in, in terms of your activism? I can choose how much danger to put myself into, okay. I think. And um, I mean, I, I have had a gun pointed at me. Or when I was with Women in Black, in our junction, there's it's the direction from Jerusalem to Gaza and Shemesh and Ramli, people who don't exactly appreciate what we're doing. And I have been in situations of violence, but compared to other people, I think, no, I'm not in a real danger. I think I'm shunned by many people, like at the university, if I sign petitions, or I will be shunned, and I know that I will be shunned, or my family can uh, have things to say that are not very respectful, or, but I don't think I'm in physical danger, unless Liebelmann continues to take over the fire ministry and other ministries, and then maybe people like us, they could be in danger. I don't think we're in danger now. And I, I wonder if that's conscious on your part to say, I'm making little steps, or is it that you really embrace the day to day because that's what it's all about? I don't measure them really, the steps. Everyone's doing their work, you know, and I'm very involved in the neighborhoods of Jerusalem, 
in the Katamonim neighborhood. It's a poor neighborhood of Jewish uh, uh, Mizrahi Jews, and that's where I wrote my pieces. And that's the, that's I have a strong commitment also to bridging inequalities within the Jewish community. And so I do what I can. People say, "Oh, it's much more important to be doing this." Much more. I don't care what's more important. Everybody does their work. Everybody's doing what they have to do. And this is what I'm committed to in, in ways that f are fulfilling to me. And that I, I guess I feel I'm a little bit part of the solution and not so much part of the problem. But still being a Jew and being in Israel and having privilege, I am still part of the problem. And it's very important to remember that. You know, I don't intend to disappear and I don't think I can go anywhere else. But you have to be conscious of the fact that it's a problem for other people. It couldn't really be a kibbutz, because a kibbutz is part of the Zionist movement that established many, many kibbutzim all over the country. So it's a cooperative village. And you can see by my choice of words that we have also deliberated what is the language that is inclusive where Jews and Palestinians can feel that it's a place where they both live. So we're just, we've decided to be a village, and not, a, not a community, not a settlement, for example. And every word has its impact with the Palestinian news, you know. But, so it's a small community, which was established between about 1976. But now I'll talk to nothing new, because I'm just saying things that I've said many times before. And uh, we live together as families. There's a bilingual, binational school in the community. And the kids at a certain point go elsewhere for their higher education. And there, is, um, a, there are two educational institutions in the community one that is working with training facilitators that I used to be very involved in, and I'm not now. I'm involved outside the community. And the school, the bilingual binational school, where people from outside come. And uh, a lot needs to be improved, improved there. But yeah, it's a regular community where people live. All of this Hamas is also part of our contribution to not having gone through that channel. So we were being inducted then also. Yeah. So you have to take that risk. So I'm not sure that Palestinians uh, who haven't achieved national uh, nationhood would be so willing quickly to become part of a Palestinian, of a Palestinian Jewish uh, binational state. But eventually, for both peoples, it will, and when, if there is good trust, and that, that's what, that, that's what the, the Communist Party in Israel wants, because Hadash has wanted forever, so it could happen. But it seems that first you need to achieve nationhood, so that you can realize that this is such a great thing, and then you build partnership. But first you have to achieve it, and uh, I think they will need a state before they will be willing to let go. They haven't even run themselves yet. You know, Jews, we're very afraid to cease to exist. We have, you know, inquisitions and holocaust and all that. The Palestinians have a fear that they will never exist. They haven't existed with nationhood yet, and we may not be able to skip over them. This might take more time. Thank you for that story. It's very interesting to learn about the work in your local community. <laughs> there cannot be a limit to what you talk about, and there cannot be a limit to who you talk to if you want things to work over time. I think Cause an idea, this time has come, cannot be stopped by anyone. Plant your seeds in fertile ground, there ain't nothing gonna keep it down. Oh, we can do it. We can do yes, we can. it. yes, we can. We can change things throughout the land. But we all must lend a hand. We can do it. Oh, yes, we can. We can do it. How is it to be thinking about these things here in this conversation? Well, I'm on vacation, so it's the time to think about it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> no, it's important. Yes, it's important. important. My kids are growing up, so now I feel that I don't really have to stick yeah. around. It's important. I don't know, listening just recently. Yeah, you know, you're probably like many of the Jewish people in Israel, unfortunately. Who, when you're a minority, you know, when you're in a minority, then Palestinians know many more Jews. But it's very easy for Jews to grow up in Israel and never to have met Palestinians or never to have had a conversation. And it's so like that here around race. But unless you're talking about Native Americans, nobody's saying you took my land. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I don't think that we could import anything to here unless the, the, the Native Americans will start uh, wanting um, nationhood and really be serious about it. Uh, I know, having grown up in Mexico, we, we studied about California and Nevada. These were occupied territories. That's how I grew up. <laughs> and I think it was a joke. And nobody, I never ever realized that, that you know, this is the history that I was getting and that it's obvious it's never going to go back to Mexico. But, uh, but other names, San Jose, San Antonio, San Francisco, these were, I that grew up with realizing. And I think that when there's consciousness like that, then things can uh, change. But things are pretty much set. And I don't know if there's lessons from what we are doing, but definitely um, uh, uh, the capacity, even the course that we're teaching now at Salem State, it's about the capacity to recognize uh, asymmetries of power mm -hmm. and the capacity to talk uh, uh, across these and not pretend they're not there. A capacity when we are in a situation of conflict and understand that the things need to change that we need to change different. I realize, luckily, I have some identities that are subdominant. You know, I'm a woman, and we have, and I know what it's like not to be the majority, not to be the one who who's in power. And I'm Ashkenazi, and so I know what it's like to be more and more in power. And so when we have those situations, then I think we understand that when those conversations do take place, and if they can be transformative, those who are in more power, we need to move over a little bit and listen more. And those who are subdominant and whose voices haven't been heard, we need to learn as women, we have had to learn to speak up and stick with it in a conflict and not disappear and not go back and not just fight. And I think in the United States, people are very nice and they're very polite. And I think conflict is a big question here. How you talk about it without just either capitulating or fighting. You know, be on, fight, fight, we will, you know. And how you stick with it in a way where both sides grow. I think it's a challenge for all of us. I hope I'm not taking too much space here. Take as much as you can. Talking about power. <laughs> okay. So I, I just want to, for me, like it was very strong when you say that it's weird for you to be here by yourself without the, uh, the other um, parts um, and be in the center. And then I, I felt like honored to, to be invited by you, but on the other side I said, I don't want to be put in this position, like I have to talk or present to anybody, but I'm very narcissistic, so I hope, I, I <laughs> like to Good. talk, so. So what I was, I just, when you talked about your daughter and the uh, army issue, I was thinking a lot, about, it took me back to an uh, experience that I had like um, two years ago I, when I was studying at the Hebrew University doing my graduate studies that I never finished and I'm hoping to finish here. Um, I was a very close friend with one of the students who was uh, a man and an Israeli and uh, he was extremely nice person. and. Like, I was telling exceptionally my family and my friends how sweet he is and how, like, always willing to help. And I did a lot of, like, three papers we did together. And we went to the Negev and we went to the Bedouins and did a paper. But, and in a certain point, uh, I went to the university and I didn't see him for two weeks. And suddenly, um, he showed up. And um, the other students who were sitting with me, they asked him, well, how was it? And, and I immediately understood that he was uh, with the, in the army um, during the war in Gaza. And um, it was like, I can't even explain um, how I felt. And, what I was thinking about then, but um, and I have a family in Gaza. Um, I don't want to add more about the story, um, but I felt very, very um, mad also at him. And how come? I mean, I have a. How come? I mean, no, you can't, Jonathan. You can't. I mean, how did you do that? But I even couldn't um, have the, this dialogue with him. 
um, I block I had like I was very close but um, then I was asking myself I mean if I was in his place I don't know how would I react I, or what I have choose, uh, chosen or um, and this relates to what I asked you how uh, how do you where do you find yourself within this complication because because for me also I have this I keep telling myself a certain story in relation to what's going on and then you have this reality which interferes in the story and makes it come on now I have to retell it to myself and in in a way to like maybe I didn't I get it wrong and then you don't understand so it's also a relate to the uh, coming and going and this reality, which always like ruin your own un understanding or your own story of the what's going on. So. Mm. I, it's not. It, I don't see myself as separate from that reality. I feel that I'm part of that reality. I'm influenced by it. I'm shaped by it, and I influence it back. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like I'm in one situation and there's a reality. I feel it's. Um, and during the, during the war uh, in, in Gaza, uh, uh, it was so um, frustrating to know that um, it was frustrating to, to know, I mean it's better not to know, many Israelis didn't want to know what's going on there. But I have many friends who live in Tel Al Balah and I was in touch with friends and I also, you know, when, the, when organizations, the Palestinian Jewish cooperative organizations, the, the, the comes, there comes a war, like a MISPA, then they look for consultants like, like me who can help them keep it together. And so here I am, I have to help them to keep it together and have to consult to them to how to continue the partnership. And at the same time, I was feeling a deep depression from frustration that I can't stop what's going on there. And what we see on the TV is nothing compared to what's happening. It was horrible, just horrible. And so I think that, I think it, it I, I, maybe it's not very patriotic for me to say, but during 1982, when the first Lebanon war, when we demonstrated and people and soldiers refused to go to a war that is not defense war, uh, the war stopped. And I think it's in the hands of all of us that we have, when we don't believe in something, we have to uh, protest it and uh, I think that war, it could have been stopped. There were many, uh, many Israelis who felt that things are getting so bad. I teach in Sapir, Sapir is the road. I was under shelling the whole time. I understand what it's about. It's not that I was sitting in Tel Aviv and they're saying, oh, you know, you can demonstrate. I know what it's about. And at the same time, when you're a few kilometers, it's the road from Gaza, and you understand that Gaza has become like a ghetto that can't breathe, that there's a blockade, what do you, how do you expect people to, to get themselves free? If there's no dialogue, if there's no conversation, if there's no real commitment to make something work, then that's all that's left, right? To bomb them. But how can you bomb? It, it was horrible. It was horrendous. It was something that it's inconceivable. And it's not something that you go to Iraq to bomb to Iraq and you come back. It's, it's, it's two kilometers from where you're teaching. And, it's, and, and, and I think it's a, I don't know what to say to you, it's, this is part of our reality and we have to be active in finding ways to, to stop it and to find alternatives. And I think people can't imagine talking anymore. There cannot be a limit to what you talk about and there cannot be a limit to who you talk to if you want things to work over time. I think you can. I must say that for many years I refused to talk to settlers. I was from the, the, the far left, and today I, I had many students who were from Gaza who were in the pullout. My sister's daughter became Chabad because of this experience. I think that we paid a heavy price for not talking with them. It was a fear that if we would talk to them, we would be affected by them, and that maybe we would be in some way uh, convinced, but that we also gave up the opportunity to impact. And it was very easy to dehumanize in the situation. And it's horrible. You, the, the really ultra-religious people, and we don't have any conversation anymore. 
and they can hate us, and we can hate them more than Palestinians and Jews sometimes. We have a common ground more with Palestinians than with people in our own people who are, who are masses and masses, and they're viewing somewhere. And this is because we haven't had the courage to talk together. I don't know if that's possible to bridge that anymore. I think we have put Ariella through yes. too much spotlight. <laughs> um, I, I personally want to thank you so much, thank you. once again, uh, for being my friend. <laughs>